Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today with a state representative from District 21 in Albuquerque, Mimi Stewart, a longtime advocate for humane and progressive education, for teachers and for sound environmental regulations. I love it that on her website, the last words in bold type are, water matters. Absolute the truth. Um, She's the chair of the Education Committee at the moment. Uh, she's had no primary opposition this year uh, because of a certain sort of uh, m movement around of the district, shall we say, um, uh, sponsored by other people other than her. Um, uh, she's um, a special education uh, teacher, now retired after 30 years, and a recognized expert in educational reform. Uh, I'm really grateful to have you here today to try and help our readers and me and everybody else understand the, the nitty-gritty behind this conflict about educational reform and what it actually means. So it's just a joy and pleasure to have you here. Well, it's great to be here, VB. I really appreciate you inviting me. I watch your show, and I've learned a lot from the people you've had on there, so I hope I can meet the bar. <laughs> you know, with all of the jumble of reporting and all of the conflicts and all all the things we hear most of us myself included find it very difficult to understand exactly what the actual goals of the martinez administration might be vis-a-vis -vis education and um and why they have infuriated so many people myself included even though i'm not completely up on on all of the fine points could you kind of give us a rundown of this boy <laughs> The goals of the Martinez administration. How much time do we have? Um, well, I can only... I So I'll tell you the answer that I think that they think their goals are. Good, good, good. But then I'll tell you what is happening as a result of what they're doing. Good. So, I mean, I've been a politician now for 20 years, a teacher for 30 Um Almost every politician I have ever met wants to improve education. You know, it's an easy thing to say, yeah. of course we're going to improve education. So I think the Martinez administration thinks they're improving education. I, I think they do want to improve it. But what that means is that they've taken these ALEC bills, the American right. Legislative Exchange Council bills that are being implemented in other states around the country, and there's four or five of them, and they're trying to implement them in New Mexico where there's not really a good fit. And there isn't in other states either, by the way. Yeah. This hubbub about education reform is going on all over the country. So what they seem to want to do is to tie student achievement on one particular test to grading of teachers and grading of schools. And by that way, by, by doing that and somehow improve education for students. But that, of course, is not what's happening. So, I mean, I think that they want to improve education, but they're very misguided in the way they're going forward with it. Um, in addition, the, the governor has appointed someone as secretary of education who can't get confirmed because she's, her appointment is really unconstitutional. She is not an educator. Um, she's never taught. Um, so she is not supposed to be the secretary of education. Um, so we can't not confirm her and we can't confirm her either. And so she remains in that position. Um, so it's, it's difficult to even talk to the Martinez administration through, um, their PED secretary designate, Hannah Scandera, because it seems as though they, they don't really know what they're doing right. and they won't really engage with the stakeholders. Um, they won't engage with the Interim Education Committee, the LESC. Um, the governor went through the budget we passed, and anywhere in the budget we put that the PED would make a report to the Interim Education Committee, the LESC, or the Financial Committee, the LFC, she line-itemed that out through wow. the entire budget. 
I think there were 30 or 40 instances. So she does not want to talk to us about education reform, her ways of education reform, which is holding kids who can't read in third grade, giving an A to F grade to every teacher um, based on some mechanism that no one can understand, give a grade to a school, um, and I'm leaving one thing out, um, and everything that sort of goes along with that is the, these ALEC bills that are that are all over the country, probably started in part by Jeb Bush in Florida. Right. Right. Um, so what they did in Florida was put $22 billion over 10 years <laughs> into their educational system to do a lot of professional development. But what it seems as though Hannah Skandera and the governor are doing is taking those things from Florida, imposing them on New Mexico um, without really funding to do it properly and with a lot of pushback because the stakeholders are not involved. So like, like many things in education done by political people who don't understand education, it's a mess. And it's, I'm afraid we're really, we're losing teachers. We have almost 700 vacancies in Albuquerque oh public schools, oh and almost 200 of them are special education teachers. Oh my God. Because what happens to special education teachers whose students, by their very nature, don't score as well on these high stakes tests um, is that their grade is they get a very bad grade. And what the governor and the secretary designate want to do is now tie that to pay through merit pay. Right, 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 right. And so this we, that's the other thing I meant to say was merit pay, yeah. along with the A to F grading yeah. of schools and teachers keeping third graders back in merit pay. So this web that they have tried to impose upon us, uh, mostly without legislation, um, is really creating problems and havocs in our public schools. So you know, I, I've been I've been a teacher for almost forty years, uh, and um, I've always been very interested in other school systems. The ones that I really objected to were processes that uh, caused uh, late bloomers to be dropped out of the system way way too early. The kind the kind of conveyor belt education that happens in Japan and in China and other places, Great Britain as well. Um, also, also in France, it's a, it's a very, it's a highly stratified, unforgiving, uh, unflexible, inflexible system, uh, which is what I believe the Martinez administration is also trying to impose upon New Mexico, a place that, that is uh, not like any place else in the country. It's certainly not like Florida. It's certainly not like Texas. It's not like California. It's not like anything. So, is the is there um, uh, why? What is the aside from the policies? I guess this is what I'm trying to ask. Policies don't normally make people so furious. There must be something else going on. It must be their approach. It must be their attitude. It must be their their personas. They just seem mean. Well, part, part of their approach is to, um, is to not listen to criticism. And they have been consistent about that. And they will not listen to criticism from anyone. Not the superintendents, not teachers, certainly not teachers, and not parents. Um, in fact, they deny that there's criticism about their policies. It's, very odd thing. They sat in front of the LESC and said, well, no one's complained to us about the teacher evaluation. <laughs> I know. It was just mind-boggling. <laughs> uh, so um, I don't think they even try. I don't think they even try to engage. Because I believe when you engage with educators, they've got a lot of ideas of how to improve things. Yeah. We have incredible superintendents around the state. They came to the interim committee with all kinds of ways to improve the evaluation system. Um, other states, and Bill Gates, and New York, and Indiana, and Illinois, there's too many to mention, they have slowed down their implementation of their teacher evaluation plan. 
the thing that's getting the most play is the teacher evaluation. Yeah. It's just, it's not fair. It is not fair. And it's not helpful to teachers. And it's not helpful to students. Now, having said that, I'll say, I'll tell you the one thing that, that superintendents, principals, and teachers are saying. The one aspect of this new evaluation system is the observations that are done in the classroom by principals or assistant principals. So some people are saying, wow, finally, I've got them to come into my classroom to have a dialogue with me. Um, the evaluation system was um, based on um, Danielson's observation system, which really tries to see how the teacher is engaging students. So, but we've changed that evaluation system. It's not really the Danielson system anymore. And we've added a lot of different things to it. You can have a class of 28 year olds. Okay, imagine you're in a room with 28 year olds <laughs> and you are doing a lesson on a uh, literature. You're, you're, you've read a story, you want to talk about the plot, the subplot, etc. According to this rubric that these principals have, if you don't have every 20 of the 20, all of those eight year olds, focusing on the teacher with their hand up or writing something or paying attention, you get discounted because you don't have every child engaged. Oh my God. Yes, you can have a couple of kids staring out the window. I tell you what, what a, what a normal classroom with 20 <laughs> year olds looks like. A couple of them are gazing out the classroom, a couple of them are doodling. You've got some that are engaged. You have some that don't look like they're engaged, they yeah. but they are. Yeah. They're listening. They're introverted. They don't like to raise their hand. They'll tell a classmate. They'll tell someone sitting next to them the answer. So you have them work in pairs or small groups. So the observation is is one thing that teachers like um, somewhat. Um, but the 50% of this teacher evaluation is based on test scores. And not any old test scores, but the standards-based assessment that we do at the end of the year that teachers don't even get the results of until the new school year has started. Wow. So they can't use it as a teaching tool. Um, that's what assessments, teachers believe assessments should be used as a teaching tool. Sure. Okay, did they get the subject matter I taught? If not, why not? What can I go back and do? What can I do better? Yeah. What can I do better? Yeah. So these, these high stakes tests that we have created um, are, feel like a gotcha. And for those teachers that don't teach math or English, for example, um, because that's what the high stakes test is based on. Their grade is based on students that they don't teach. And it, it's even, it gets so much more complicated really? than this. That yes, they don't that teach. they do not teach. God, that's, that's awful. So um, it, it, there are just so many parts of this teacher evaluation that it's hard to even explain it. It's now, and, and the, the public education department changes it. This last year, they change it every two or three weeks. I am not kidding. They said that they had to approve any end of course exams that we had on top of the standards-based assessment. So districts sent their end of course exams into them. They changed them all. They didn't approve any of them. They actually changed them. And um, at the end of last year, I think it was in March, they hadn't even sent those end of course exams back, end of course exams back. And they now won't let teachers look at the end of course exams. Oh, so you're teaching geometry, and you don't know what's in the test at the end of the course? Yeah. So that doesn't make sense to people. Not only that, but they required, the PED required that some students take end of course exams and subjects that they'd had two years earlier. So you took biology as a freshman. Oh, well, you didn't have an approved PED end of course exam. So you're a junior or senior. You better take that end of course exam. Now. Now. Yeah. Yes. After you haven't had biology in all this time. So if you really think about students 
instead of teachers. We're really harming students by these methods um, because we're testing too much. So many days are dedicated to testing. Then the end of course exams, the standards-based assessment, which if you don't pass, you can take over a couple of times. Um, the, uh, so you have to have time for retesting. Um, then, of course, you've got the SAT and the PSAT at the junior level. I mean, we can't even teach anymore. There is so much time set aside for testing. So both kids and teachers are not liking teaching very much anymore. You know, I taught for 30 years. It was fun to go to work every day yeah. because I had a relationship with those students. Yeah. And because they were special education students, that relationship was really important. Of course, I believe it's important for any of these students that come to our schools. So, so kids come to schools and the teacher's trying to work out my relationship with them so that they'll trust the teacher, they'll listen, they'll like school, they'll want to be there, there's something in it for them, they're going to study, oh, we're going to look at dinosaurs today, or oh man, I want to, you know, read this book about making a tree house, I want to make a tree house, or whatever. So you learn your students, you make a relationship with them, and then you build your curriculum around ideas that they have, they bring, that will instill in them the skills necessary to teach. So that is a very complicated dance mm -hmm. that you do from the beginning of the school year till the end of the school year. And if you've got 80 days out of your 180 that's set aside for test preparation, test review, um, taking tests over again, or taking them, and all of that pressure that we're putting on both students and teachers, it's, it's not as much fun anymore as it used to be for everybody. And that's a problem, and it's a problem in New Mexico. We have very special students in New Mexico. We have the highest percentage of students that come to school learning English as their second language. Now, English is a pretty hard language to learn to read because you know we only have 26 letters of the alphabet but there's eight ways to write yeah. the long a sound yeah, right. you know so we have this alphabetic code that some kids think is well there's a secret code yes there is a secret code. nobody knows what it is <laughs> and you better learn it from kindergarten to second grade because in third grade you're supposed to be able to implement that yeah. code so we have a lot that we have to teach them but um but we want to do it in such a way so that they want to learn it. And, and really, most teachers want to instill in their students a love of learning. Sure. And I think most teachers have a love of learning themselves. Of so if only they had been involved in the creation of the teacher evaluation, um, if they'd only been involved in which tests are appropriate to, to to, so that it will further the education of the students, not, not what politicians layer on them. And that's what we're doing. We are layering on these high stakes tests um, to prove to somebody that we're gonna reform education. When really what we need to do is fully fund them and let them do their work like they do in Finland. Absolutely. They don't do tests in Finland, one of the highest countries to score in these international tests. They don't do these competitive testing. Um, they don't have the, um, the high stakes nature. They don't grade schools and teachers the way we are and then tie it to merit pay. They fully fund the schools and they treat teachers as professionals. And guess what? They become professionals um, because they have the resources and the means and the societal uh, backup to do what they need to do. So, you know, other, other countries, there are many other countries that are outperforming us. Um, however, if you look at the poverty index of each of these countries, and you compare the U.S. in that way, so the bottom 10, 10th, um, the bottom 10%, um, and then with the top 10%, economics. Um, those students in all of these countries we're talking about score about the same. So and if you're in the bottom poverty, 10% in Finland or Singapore, which have very high scores, or the U.S., 
you're in the bottom part of the test. Yeah. So these high stakes tests really spread kids out on a continuum of poverty. I've had the opportunity, uh, the happy opportunity to know many teachers. I, and I really haven't met, and this is the truth, I don't think I've met a single teacher who didn't, one, love children, two, have a, a lifelong engagement with their own discipline, who have been frustrated as scholars, as teaching scholars, because it was never rewarded in the first place. But, but even now, it's, and so they are professionals. Children are not widgets. They are not supposed to be treated like, you know, like a Ford motor plant, you know, sort of moving through. They're individual human beings. And you, I guess what it seems to me is, is, that, is that we suddenly have a bunch of amateurs trying to run a bunch of professionals. And these people are truly amateurish. This is not a factory system. Anyway, could you explain a little bit about, um, about the tests that kids are run through? Uh, and um, you know, sometimes testing can be a learning experience. In my experience, however, that's rare uh, because they punish people. And if you're not a good tester, as many people are not, now they're going to punish the teachers, uh, you know, for people who have in a difficulties testing, who probably know the material quite well if they weren't under pressure. Anyway, could you ramify about that a little bit? So the way it used to work in school was that the teacher was the person who made up the test yes. because it was the teacher that taught the material. That's still how they do it in Finland. They do it that way in Singapore. They do it in many other countries. But it's really since No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind started this yearly testing of standards-based assessments. What No Child Left Behind did, though, is it let every state set its own standards and every state develop its own test. So New Mexico, um, in that time, always got high marks for their standards. We had pretty good standards. There were too many. We went into way too much detail. So it was a little harder on, on teachers to even understand what those standards meant. We had to unpack them, and then we had to pull out the big ideas, and put them on our wall and all of that. So we've been doing standards for a long time. But now, after No to Left Behind and those yearly tests, um, and those yearly tests, when we say standards-based assessment, they're supposed to assess the standards that you teach to, okay? There's, there's only a handful of testing companies, though, in the country. and Now, they're making a lot of money now, and they're going to make a lot more. It's those testing companies that states would hire to set up these standards-based assessments. And then they would norm them. So they take everybody who takes it, and then they spread everybody out on a bell curve. It's the old bell curve where there's always going to be kids that score below a certain amount because that's the way we design it. Yeah, not because <laughs> of the reality. That's the way we design it. We design the cut scores. We set the cut scores. We design the bell curve. We design the whole test like that. So we've done it to ourselves over the years. Now what's happened is that this common core state standards have kind of taken a hold of states. Um, they, I don't know if Bill Gates thought them up himself, but his company certainly funded the development of those common core. Now I should tell you that I think the common core standards are better than the New Mexico standards that we have now. They're, more, they're simplified. It's easier to understand what the big ideas are. The standards do promote much more of a higher level thinking um, where you have to analyze and create and design and synthesize rather than just answering a multiple choice, you know, um, what year did um, the Civil War start? So, you know, that's a little minor memorization skill versus read this passage and tell me what you think the author is trying to say and write it in an essay. So the standards-based assessment tests were, were easy and quick 
And they didn't do much except spread kids out in a continuum. Wow. On a bell curve. On a bell curve. And the new tests are going to do the same thing. The new tests are going to be based on the Common Core State Standards, which in and of themselves are good. The problem is we haven't put really any money or time into having teachers understand how they have to change their teaching for these standards, how to get to that next level of mm -hmm. higher level teaching. Yeah. Um, we haven't put any money into that. Um, Flor uh, Tennessee put in $44 million and took four years and trained 70,000 teachers. Jay. We have 24,000 teachers in New Mexico. Maybe a tenth of them have had a little training from PED, a little training from PED, of, that they, of course, sent the money to an out-of-state, for-profit, professional development corporation, because that's what they like to do, is send New Mexico money out to get someone else to come and do education stuff, because they don't really know what they're doing. So, um, so we have these Common Core State Standards. We're about to impose this new test on top of the state based on the Common Core. So we're going to be testing kids on different standards that they haven't been taught no. all this time. So that really messes up if you're about to graduate from high school because yeah. we've really changed the standards in the middle. Um, we've imposed these new tests. The new tests, we field tested them this year. I actually went online and looked at one of the tests um, a couple of days ago, and I don't know, they're going to be hard because it's, um, they seemed subjective, not objective. Um, so, so I read this one passage, and then it said, you know, what's the main idea? Well, I thought, okay, and then I read their choices. I said, well, I didn't. I don't think any of those choices <laughs> oh, are the main idea, uh, or they're all the main idea. How do you choose? Yeah. So, um, so we've ratcheted up the test. We've ratcheted up the standards. We're tying it to teacher pay, teacher grades, teacher pay to school grades, and we're leaving the kids out of the whole mix because they're the ones that. Um, are not going to be able to graduate because they can't pass the high stake tests. Um, these are the ones that are are not liking school anymore because it's mostly testing, not learning. Um, they're taking these end of course exams that, you know, were on subject several several years ago. Um, and I am I am not exaggerating. I'm not. I'm not exaggerating. You talk to any teacher, any superintendent, any principal around this state, and they will go into more detail about what I'm saying. Last year in the legislative session this January, we had public comment from all over the state. We had 128 people come from, I think it was 15 different districts, Artesia, you know, for, uh, South Las Cruces, all the way up to Taos, Farmington, Aztec. We had superintendents, we had principals, we had teachers, we had parents, we had school board members. Only one person spoke in favor of any of the governor's reforms. The 100, 127 people talked about how they were getting their life ruined, they didn't like teaching anymore, they were going to quit, or what was happening to their students. Because um, it's really the students that we keep leaving out. But if you don't have a teacher that is present, that loves their job, that wants to go to work that day, that's not worried about a high-stakes test and his or her salary tied to that, is, is making enough money so they don't have to work at Walmart at night or on the weekend. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a teacher that's ever that's present, then you don't have kids that are learning as well. So, um, so it really is getting down to the child level. Now we have an we have opt out. We have opting out um, uh, movements going on all over the country. We have a huge one in New York where parents have opted out. Thousands of parents have opted their kids out from taking the test. But the problem is if they opt out, then there's not enough kids at the school to take the test. So the school grade goes down automatically. Oh, of course. 95%. You've got to have 95% mm. 
there. If you have 94%, instead of getting a B, you go down to a C, or a C to a D, or a D to an F. So it's draconian in the details of both the school grading and the teacher grading. And it, it gets us away from what teaching and learning is all about. And it gets us away from what can happen in a classroom, which is so magical. Mm. Classrooms are magical. Yeah. And, um, and you've, you've got so many teachers around this state who, who could be doing a fantastic job, but that are now worried about their own personal, professional life because of what we're doing to them. So I guess it might seem simplistic to say, but in an ideal world, it seems to me, uh, you train, you allow teachers to become educated in subjects that they love. You allow them to become experts in subjects that they love. You put some students in the context with these people who love their subjects, and they convey not only the love of their subject, but the content of their subject as best they can. This has always been, you know, the simple, the simple model of a real educational system. It seems to me, well, I guess um, um, that this is not education. This is the ruination of education. It is trying to make androids out of it. I suppose I don't want to launch into uh, silly metaphors, but what, what could we do in New Mexico, say, over the next four or five or eight years? Uh, uh, should we have a different view take over here? What is possible? to turn our educational system from a, a travesty into something that is almost idealistic. No, VB, I do a lot of reading in my role as education chair because I'm asked to go to conferences and speak for New Mexico, et cetera. So I really have been trying to research what they do in other countries, what they do in other states. You know, the, the, um, the folks that beat the odds schools that beat the odds. But so I want to talk about the American Institutes of Research um, that came into the state uh, for a period of three or four years with an interim um, education reform committee to look at um, our funding formula and how we could do a better job of uh, ensuring that every student was able to get a good education. What the, and we, we t took two years, it cost a million dollars. The legislature put money in and so did the districts. That study showed that we were underfunding the schools by about 15%. Um, that was on the 2008 budget for education. Okay, so, and what happened right after 2008? The bottom dropped out of every economy, every state economy. So we have not yet even gotten back to the 2008 budget, oh, even with the one we passed this year. It, it, it was back to that budget when it came out of House Ed, but by the time it passed and the governor vetoed money, it was not back to that. So, so since 2008, we've sent the schools um, about 15% less than what they've needed over the last five years. Wow. So we're in a hole. Yeah. We, have, we have just done away with some programs entirely. We've packed more kids into classrooms. We, for five years, teachers have not had a raise, and in fact, they've had to pay more for their own pension out of their own pocket. Right. Right. We have cut about 3,000 educator positions around this state. We've cut about 3,500 um, state workers. So if the governor would just like to increase jobs in the state, she could hire those people back. <laughs> we need them. So, so we're starving the schools in New Mexico. And what that study said was that we, gosh, we had about 2,500 people involved in that study through online or through focus groups, through professional standards councils. And so I got to hear what teachers and principals and administrators said they needed to take education to the next level. So we're talking about summer school for students that aren't doing well, immediate credit recovery programs in middle and high school. So, you know, you flunk algebra semester one, um, you get to take it after school um, in semester two to try to pass it. 
um, or even at night, um, at night school. So um, immediate credit recovery programs. Um, an expansion of kindergarten, pre-kindergarten. These kids that are coming to us at five and six years old um, already have missed out on several years of good learning. Kids from poverty, kids that are from dysfunctional families, they just need extra help. Sure. So pre-kindergarten, expand pre-kindergarten. And some districts around the state that have seen very high test scores, remember, of course, it's the bell curve, right. um, have um, have improved because they have sent every one of their four-year-olds to a pre-kindergarten classroom. Wow. So include pre-kindergarten classroom. Um, we have a program called K3+, Plus, which extends the school years by 25 days in high poverty schools, a voluntary um, for the district, the teacher, the school, et cetera. But we have about eight, nine, 10,000 kids going through that. They do much better. Sure. So an expansion of that, because we only do it for a certain number of kids, just budgetary. Um, Professional development for teachers. Time to collaborate. You know what they do in all of these Asian school districts? They teach only about half a day, and the other half of the day is spent trying to figure out what's the best way to teach fractions with other teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you teach this? Um, let's do some demonstration lessons, um, putting lessons together, working collaboratively. In the U.S., especially now where all this testing is, and it's all competitive, because, you know, why are you going to help the teacher next to you if, you know, mm -hmm. you're testing? you know, depends on your grade and your salary, etc. So instead of this competition and this gotcha, this blame the teachers and shame the teachers, we need to collaborate. We need to have more time in the day where teachers can work together to, uh, to improve their craft. And they want to do that, and they can do it, and they know how to do it. But we don't put time in the day, and we move so far away from that. So um, truancy officers bilingual truancy officers that can go out in the district and talk to parents about why is your kid not at school? You know, can we help you with these social services? You know, can we do something to make your life easier so your kids come to school? So one of the latest research papers that I have read has has come out of um, University of California is that they did a longitudinal study on um, kids from poverty that actually had 20% um, increased funding over a period of years when they were in school. And guess what? If you increase the funding to do all these things I just talked about, you have kids that get out of poverty, that will improve their education, do better on all those tests, move out of the bottom part of the bell curve into the middle or the top. And so it really is a matter of funding and then letting these schools do what they know they need to do. It seems that, um, that the relationship between the student and the teacher has been completely forgotten in, in the Martinez administration. The, uh, all students are, everybody when they're young, are worried that they're not doing the right thing, that they're not, that they're not moving in the right direction, they're not trying to understand the right stuff. That's what a teacher is for, is to help them feel confident, confident enough to exercise their own native abilities to learn, which is the really the great characteristic of the human animal, right? We're adaptable, we learn as if we were drinking water, as if we were walking. It's the thing we do the most naturally. So school systems that clog that up and pinch it off and destroy it are, are devastating, they're immoral, in my judgment, uh, in my humble judgment. Uh, what um, what can we do to, uh, assuming that we don't have a lot of these issues to contend with all the time and to fight against, what can we do to give that relationship between student and teacher its proper place in our education system? What does it require? Boy, what a great question. <laughs> you know, I've, I've taught for 30 years, um, 20 of them in the classroom, and... And then I've been in the legislature the last 20 years, and I've done a lot of education bills. But I, and, and we've imposed things on schools and districts that I haven't liked. Um, I knew four years ago when we all voted for this high school redesign that there was 
several poison pills in it, um, requiring Algebra 2. Not everybody can do Algebra 2. And requiring the standards-based assessment. I knew that was a mistake then. But through all these reforms, etc., I always felt like um, teachers were going to be okay because, you know, most of them really do love um, teaching. And um, it's fun to have these relationship with kids. Kids are just kids. Yeah. Um, it's fun to have really even the difficult ones. It's a challenge. True. So, so I don't, you know, teachers like to have a successful day, successful week, successful year, whatever. Um, so I've always thought it's all right. You've still got that relationship. You still have that classroom. No matter if, okay, you didn't get a salary. All right. Well, okay. Um, so I think teachers are teaching for the right reasons. So I've always felt that that student-teacher relationship was, um, was sacrosanct yeah. and that it would remain in that classroom and it would remain um, what was really driving things in spite of the um, erratic political winds. Um, but I'm starting to feel like that relationship really is in danger mm -hmm. because of what we've done. And um, it really is a worry and a problem. And I, I go into schools and I talk to teachers about it. And, um, you know, they're trying to rise above it. They really are. They're trying to downplay the tests. I have to do that when I have students visit me. You know, they. I had these eighth graders from one of my middle schools say, "Oh, Miss Stewart, Miss Stewart, our school got an F. You know, we we don't think it's an F." And I said, "Well, you're graduating from eighth grade. You didn't get an F. You are A students, and you are going on to high school." I said, "Just disregard that. That is not important. It's not important." You know, I live in a working class district, and I don't have any schools in my district that are in the A or B category Ugh. and not many in the C category because that's where the poor kids are but they're fantastic yes. and they are graduating yes. and they're going on to high school so so we're we're trying to downplay the tests the grades and what is happening but um but it's it's a problem and I and I've never worried like I am now about that sacrosanct teacher-student relationship because what we are doing is about to ruin it. So, um, so we have to stop doing this. And you know, other states have slowed this all the way down. They've, in fact, New Jersey, I think, is just voting on it yesterday to delay these teacher evaluations. The teacher evaluations are the worst because it just ruins that teacher's ability to teach the way she knows or he th that they need to teach. They, they know they shouldn't be focusing on tests. They need to be focusing on a good classroom environment and the subject matter and getting a love of learning and having a classroom that kids want to come to. So um, I, I, I still have hope that we can overcome these, but, but it's, it's really damaging our schools right now in several other states. And as I say, even Bill Gates has just come out saying there should be a two-year moratorium before you tie a teacher evaluation to these high-stakes tests. These high-stakes tests were never designed to do this. The American Statistical Association has come out completely against what we're doing, uh. tying a teacher evaluation to one point in time on a high-stakes test designed to spread kids out on a bell curve. So... Um, I'm hoping that there's going to be a little bit more thought put in. Um, we Superintendents, principals have been asking the governor and the secretary designate to slow down and get it right. That's what they've been saying from the beginning. And they've just said no. I know our kids are too important. Our kids are important, which is why we need to slow it down. Bring in stakeholders. Get it right. Yeah. Um, and stop ruining 
what is the best thing about our cl classrooms, which is this good, solid relationship that you have to have as a teacher so that you can reach kids, so that you can get them to buy into your classroom, love to learn, and to succeed. So it it really is a worry, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad you brought it up, so your viewers will worry with me. <laughs> I guess it's almost, uh, almost goes without saying, but almost. There's ever a reason to get out the boat. This November, it's education, it's the environment, it's water matters and all kinds of other things. Perhaps next, uh, next time we talk, we can talk about water. And uh, I'd love to hear your views. This has been an inspiring, energized, exciting interview. I've learned a tremendous amount, and I'm sure all of our audience has too. Thank you so much for being here. Well, and thank you, VB. I appreciate your giving us a forum, those of us that are in the weeds up there in Santa Fe. So uh, I love to talk about water. So I, I, um, I don't know as much about it. I know this education stuff forward and backward. In fact, I really know too much. <laughs> <laughs> Never knowing too much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.